This is webinar number 19 um, in the CPT webinar series. And what we're going to talk about today is CPT and groundwater. Not necessarily always the, the typical uh, topic when we talk about CPT, but it's something that was brought uh, up by uh, some of you uh, that you want to get some more information about that. So that's uh, why we will cover that in, in this webinar today. Okay, CPT and groundwater. Uh, I pulled this uh, picture. Uh, from the groundwater.org uh, website and basically what you have in, in many places um, not too far below the surface in, in Holland where I grew up it was almost immediately below the surface you had a completely saturated uh, zone because the groundwater level was there just inches below a uh, grade level but at some point below grade you'll start with your unsaturated zone where there is some water uh, in, in the soil uh, then you will reach your, your water table, and then below that you have a fully saturated zone. And for all kinds of reasons uh, that may be of interest to, to know what, what's happening there, and CPT can, can give you some information about that and give you some, some useful information from, that comes from a different angle that maybe not everybody is familiar with, and that's why we're going to talk today about CPT and groundwater. But I would be missed if I did not show you this, this picture on the left. Uh, for those of you that have attended the previous 18, I think I've shown it in every single webinar because it's really the basis of CPT. You come with a, whether it's a truck or a crawler or any other carrier, you bring your pusher to, uh, to the job site, you push the cone into the ground uh, at this, this standard rate of uh, 20 millimeters per second to 0.8 inches per second. And that cone that you see enlarged there uh, on the left-hand side of your screen measures the, the tip resistance indicated by the red arrow, uh, the sleeve friction, and then the poor water pressure. And those three parameters create what Paul Main of, of Georgia Tech or previously of Georgia Tech uh, would refer to as the squiggly lines. What's important there is that since we're going to talk about groundwater, we'll just focus on the, the poor water pressure, is that the pore water pressure that we measure with, with the cone is not the hydrostatic pressure. The reason for it is very simple. As you push the cone into the ground at the speed of uh, 0.8 inches per second, you create dynamic effects. And as a result, uh, what you measure are the lines that you see there at the, uh, the dark blue, at the, the squiggly line, whereas the hydrostatic pressure is the, the, the straight line that you see in, in the lighter blue. So the dynamic pressure, uh, again here now in black, uh, is this this pore pressure that you measure during penetration. And it's very important that you realize that it's not the hydrostatic pressure, because that hydrostatic pressure, uh, indicated here by the light blue line, uh, is obviously zero above the water table, and then it slowly starts to increase as a function of, of depth. And the only reason, or the only way that you can determine what that equilibrium pore water pressure is or the hydrostatic pore water pressure is, is when you know where the groundwater level is. If you don't know that, then obviously you, you have a problem at defining what that, that blue line is all about. But what we are finding then as well is you can go then one step further, you can deduct the equilibrium pore pressure from the dynamic pore pressure and that gets you then the excess pore water pressure. And that excess pore water pressure is purely as a result of the dynamic effects as you push the cone in the ground. And we use that to indicate what kind of soil behavior you can expect as part of your, your CPT. Most of you have seen these graphs before as well. Most of us only focus on, on the left-hand side where we uh, make a correlation between the tip resistance and the friction ratio. But we also have the pore pressure chart on, on the right-hand side where you have the same correlation, the same 12 areas when you talk about the pore pressure or at least the pore pressure element in there because it's really not the true pore pressure, it's the excess pore water pressure uh, plug, um, plotted against the, uh, the cone resistance, the tip resistance, and it gives you the indication of the, how the soil behaves. So, with that pore water pressure, we, we can uh, give you a second indication of what the soil behavior is, but 
obviously that has nothing to do necessarily with the the groundwater which is the main topic of, of this uh, presentation one final remark though that i often see is uh, or a question that i get is uh, you see here two charts uh, the relationship between friction ratio and tip resistance and the pore pressure uh, or excess pore pressure and the tip resistance do we get the same results answer is no um, sometimes we do uh, what you see here uh, is just some uh, result that i pulled out and you see that uh, near uh, two meters below grade it uh, both gives a, uh, a site uh, class or a soil classification of uh, number seven uh, which when you see here that the silt is sent to sandy silt but when you go farther down i say around three meters uh, one chart gives a number six another one gives a number seven and it just depends on you know, sometimes uh, transitions are not exactly the same but it gives you an indication because let's face it number six is sandy silt to uh, silty sand uh, number seven is silty sand to sandy silt yeah it's not all that different uh, so the fact that one says one thing and the other says another thing is not all that surprising but since we have an excess pore water pressure one of the things that we can do is come up with a dissipation test what that basically is is you stop your cpt you measure the pressure that you have the pore water pressure that you uh, record with you, your cone at the very beginning and then you just sit there and wait and in this case in this example here uh, we start out with a pore water pressure of about 0.395 megapascal and for those of you that are in inch pound units don't worry about the, the units that much right if it's relevant i will give them in both in inch pound units as well as in si units um, but you sit there and you just wait and wait and wait and wait and lo and behold after in this case not all that, that long after about five minutes or so we see that the pressure starts to stabilize and you end up with a 0 0.035 megapascal pressure and that's where it stabilizes and then you know for sure that that is the hydrostatic pressure so that's one way of, of going around it and in that case what you see here uh, is the uh, the 0 0.035 megapascal uh, which uh, equates to 35,000 uh, pascal and then you can calculate that uh, the uh, the groundwater table is about 3.57 meters above the depth where the uh, the test is, is done and I apologize for the, the last part here I don't know what it's in here but the LLVC that should just be eliminated uh, it's a typing error um, but it gives you an indication you know, because that hydrostatic pressure is just a water column above the test depth so you end up with about 3.6 meters and if we do the same thing now in PSI units yeah, lo and behold, fortunately, we end up again uh, close to 12 feet, and 12 feet is about the same that we came up with in SI units. So whether you use in SI units or in uh, inch-pound units, uh, you end up with the same result. But what you also see in this, this graph is T50, because sometimes uh, if you already know where your... Um, water table is if you know that you know what that water table where it is going to be uh, then you could go a little bit faster with a, a different result or try to get a different result and what i mean by that is that here in this case it didn't take that long to get to the equilibrium pressure but in cohesive soils it will take a long time it could take days before you get there but if i already know my water table then i know what my hydrostatic pressure is and then I know what my starting pressure is, and then I just wait until 50% of that excess pressure has dissipated away. And that gets me the T50. And the T50, that, that's important, because what happens is that, that gives you a very good indication of the hydraulic conductivity. And that gives you then an idea again how easily groundwater can, can flow. The other thing that's important of the T50, you see in this case that it's about eight seconds. I told you that it would take about uh, 330 seconds or so before you have the final pressure. So that basically means that it takes 40 times longer to dissipate the entire pressure away versus the first 50%. And that's why it's important that you 
know what kind of soil you are uh, because it can take it to dissipate all the pressure away can really take an awful long time and if you shorten that if you don't have to wait until uh, figuring out where uh, what the equilibrium pressure is that you can just go there that again sh shortens quite a bit and why is it t50 so important uh, what you can do from that you can basically uh, come up with a correlation a fairly uh, tight correlation that tells you, you know, what kind of soil you actually have because what you see in here is that the t50 now, there's a very clear indication whether you're in sand or in silty sand or in silt or in, in clay. And you can also see that the T50 now, could easily take more than a thousand seconds, now, which basically means more than uh, 16 minutes. Now, and that's the first part. And if you don't have to wait 40 times uh, more than that, that is really hours and hours and hours before you finally get uh, the uh, complete excess pressure is, is uh, dissipated away. So um, that's one of the things that you can do with uh, this uh, the, the dissipation test. Important to know, though, that in uh, you should not change anything during that uh, the dissipation test. So that's why you unclamp your your cone uh, so that you don't get any uh, pressure change on the whole thing and just let the, the filter element work on this whole thing. And then. Now, something I've told you before, if you have to do a dissipation test to figure out where the water table is, uh, do it in sand, because sand is your friend. It really takes not that much time. If you decide to do it in clay, uh, well, you better just go uh, get a coffee and uh, be patient, because it could take you quite some time, and then don't get all upset, because it just takes time. Now you may wonder, well, why are you telling me about a dissipation test? Because the result of a dissipation test is really that it says something about uh, the, the soil conditions. You know, I thought you were going to talk about groundwater. Uh, so why is a dissipation test coming, uh, coming up? Uh, the reason uh, for that is that um, the, or that it's best illustrated in a, oh, and I go here the wrong way. I apologize for that. Let me just try to get rid of this thing. Um, there we are. Um, what we have here is a uh, an example where we have a, a dam or a levee, whatever you want to call it. Now we have water in, in the one side, and you have your dam. Uh, you have a drainage uh, channel uh, there, drainage ditch. Uh, we have some uh, various uh, uh, drains installed, and we want to figure out what is happening with the ground for the level and where does the what is the ground level at the various locations. And obviously, what you could do is you could install a piezometer, uh, one piezometer, two piezometers, three piezometers, whatever you want to do it and then try to come up with uh, an indication of what your, your ground level is. Or you can do a CPT. And what you see here uh, on the, the tree on the left-hand side is the, uh, the squiggly lines again uh, that you have in, in there, uh, the tip resistance, the, the uh, friction uh, ratio, and then you have your dynamic pore water pressure. But what have we done now? We have done dissipation tests and we've done those dissipation tests at six different levels indicated here by one to six and we just in all cases are not waiting for the t50 and we're not stopping halfway through we are basically going all the way yeah, till till the end so that your pressure completely dissipates away and what we see here at level number one is that it completely dissipates all the way away and two we end up with about 8 kPa. Uh, at 3, we end up with about 55 kPa. Uh, at 4, lo and behold, yeah, we lose everything again, uh, and you see the whole thing going there. So now, by using dissipation tests at different levels, I get a very nice indication of what my hydrostatic pressure is not by dynamic pore pressure because by the uh, dynamic pore pressure is where I start the dissipation test but what my hydrostatic 
pressures at different levels. And what's important then is to compare it with the graph that I have uh, shown here now, or brought in on the uh, the right hand side of the uh, the screen. The brownish line is what I showed you before. That is what came out of the CPT. Now, I could have put a single piezometer in there. And with that single piezometer, yeah, that could give you uh, this uh, blue dashed line, uh, gives you an indication of what's happening. But you see that it's completely unrelated to what you are finding from your uh, CPT measurement. You could also put a whole bunch of piezometers in there. And I just arbitrarily put some, some data in there that could have been indic indicative, but you see again, you get a much better curve from your uh, your CPT at, by doing dissipation tests at different uh, elevations. So that gives you an indication why and how you can use CPT by adding the dissipation test uh, to to get a better idea of what your your groundwater level is, and also what your pore water pressure, your groundwater pressure really is at, at different elevations. This, you could go one step further. And that brings me up, or brings me back to what I started out at the very beginning. What you see here is uh, before the saturated zone, or above the saturated zone, I should say, uh, before, because as you go down with your cone, you start seeing your unsaturated zone first, and then you get your saturated zone. But above that is this unsaturated zone. And sometimes you want to know where yeah, it's saturated and where it's unsaturated. And you may say, well, that's simple. Yeah, that's just a matter of figuring out where my water table is. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. And that's where we start adding one more element to this whole thing, and it is seismic CPT. Yeah, I've told you in one of the previous webinars that the um, Various modules are the friends of the cone. It gives you additional information. Uh, and basically, what you have here is a seismic unit uh, where we now do our CPT, but behind it, we have a module with a seismic sensor and we create uh, shear waves at the, the surface and we measure the, the shear waves and we might even create compression waves at the surface and measure the compression waves as well. And in a past webinar, I've covered this, and I don't want to spend too much time on the seismic CPT here. But from what you get from that is uh, you can figure out where what the arrival times are of the seismic waves at various depths, and then you can come up with your shear wave and your compression wave velocity profile. Now, why do I say all this stuff? Let's go back to uh, what I mentioned earlier. We do our CPT. Now you see here the tip resistance, uh, the, the friction ratio, and you see your uh, your pore water, your dynamic pore water pressure uh, at the three charts starting from, from the left. And I go do, again, my dissipation tests. And that gets me a, a nice curve with your um, hydrostatic water pressure indicated by the, the brownish line in the middle of this graph. But now I'm going to go one step further and I'm going to do a seismic CPT. And that seismic CPT gets me a, an indication if I do the compression wave of something else. If the soil is completely saturated, the compression wave velocity will be roughly 1500 meters per second. If it's not saturated, it will be less than that. And it's a very strict transition. It goes somewhere from 96, 97, 95% unsaturated. I have a low velocity, of, in this case, somewhere 500, maybe 700 meters per second. But as soon as I reach this 97% to 100%, it shoots up to 1500 meters per second. And what I see now is that initially by doing my compression wave velocity curve, I see that above about 15 meters, I have fully unsaturated zone. Then between 15 and say 26 meters, I have kind of a different zone where sometimes it's fully saturated, about 1500 meters per second, sometimes it's not. So it's not a fully saturated zone, it's kind of a transition area where you have some uh, perched uh, water tables. 
and then from about 26 meters, I have a fully saturated zone. So now what you see in there is that you're going to get a um, an area where you know not only know what is your hydrostatic pressure, but you can also by using a friend of the cone come up with what is uh, what the uh, zone is completely saturated or not. That's one thing. Then you can go one step further, and that is it's at some point if you also get your uh, shear wave velocity, you can also indicate whether you have liquefaction, whether it's possible or not. Because if the for liquefaction to be possible, uh, the, the shear wave velocity needs to be below a certain value. Again, it's not important right now, the actual values, uh, it's, it's more the principles, and that's why you only see them here in SI units. But now you see that with CPT, I can learn much more about groundwater. I can see whether uh, what my hydrostatic pressures are as a function of depth, and it doesn't have to be always a straight line. I can see what whether the soil is completely saturated or not, and I can also see uh, whether there, as a result of that uh, flow liquefaction is possible or, or not. And that gives you a good indication. And you all do that by initially using the dissipation test, not just to come up with the T50, uh, that gives you good indication of the hydraulic conductivity, which also then allows you to get a feel for how the groundwater will flow through through the soil. But you go all the way to the end to, to really find out where the, the groundwater stabilizes uh, to come up with your hydrostatic pressures, and then use the friend of the cone, in this case the seismic module, to get more information about your saturation and potentially also the, the potential for, for liquefaction. So, in conclusion, um, CPT can, can provide valuable information. Well, that should not come as a surprise because you know I'm a cone head and um, that CPT can provide valuable information. We know that. But it's not just on the soil behavior or on uh, information that you need for foundation design. It can also give you valuable information on groundwater uh, at the test location, especially yeah, if you add the dissipation testing and the seismic test, uh, testing uh, as part of your site investigation. And it uh, reinforces again what we said some, some time ago about the friends of, of the cone. The cone in and of itself gives useful information, but by putting something else behind it, uh, you get some more information. So that brings me to, to the end of uh, the, the presentation uh, today. Um, a, uh, a few uh, questions uh, that uh, that have uh, can come up. Um, one question was: Can the size of the probe have an effect on the dissipation rate? Uh, not really. You know, basically, uh, the, obviously, if you have a, a larger cone, you may get slightly different uh, dynamic effects. But in principle, the, the cones that that we have, uh, whether it's a 10 or a 15 centimeter square cone, uh, we we don't differentiate between that. Uh, and the dissipation rate is basically the same. Um, same person mentioned in there that uh, Robertson says that in some place to leave the clamp on for, for tip pressure uh, and pressure around the cone. I agree that there are some indications where there's some situations where you have to leave the clamp on. Uh, I'm not saying that everything is, is covered by what I said earlier. In principle, the, the starting point is that you should unclamp uh, the uh, uh, your uh, your cone and the CPT string, but sometimes the things go very fast, uh, and therefore in, in that case as well, there may be situations where it makes sense to uh, to keep the clamp on. Uh, and again, uh, there there are all kinds of other issues, and maybe one of these days I need to go back to the dissipation test and give you a better idea what the dissipation test is and how to, to perform it, and then we can go through that in, in more detail. How accurate is CPT and the dissipation test in unsaturated zones? Very accurate. Um, the, the dissipation test gives you very good indications of what your, uh, uh, what your values are. Uh, how quickly it dissipates, because basically what you're doing is you're getting this dynamic effect. Uh, you, you're creating water pressure. Now, 
obviously, if your excess forward pressure is very limited, then the accuracy goes down. Because if you have a very limited amount, very small amount of excess pore water pressure, then it, it takes no time for that to, to dissipate away. So you want to have a situation where you have some, some a decent amount of excess pore water pressure and then let that dissipate away to get a reasonable uh, indication of what your, your T50 is. So it is not always you can say, hey, in every unsaturated zone, you can get an accurate dissipation test you need to have a decent amount of excess uh, pore water pressure that can, can uh, dissipate away. Um, those are most of the questions. Uh, the remaining questions I will answer by, uh, by email. My email address is uh, what you see here. Uh, you can also go to, to the ICOCOMP uh, website and send just an uh, uh, email there or leave a message there or send a message to cpt at icocomp.com. Uh, that will come my way as well. And I'm more than happy to uh, provide you with more information about CPT, whether it's in this webinar or at any time if you want to get some more information.